Welcome to The Point, a podcast by Apex Benefits and dedicated to employee benefits thought leadership. You can find more episodes for free on iTunes by searching The Point or Apex Benefits. Please rate, review, and subscribe to be the first to know about what we have in store for you. To learn more about Apex Benefits, please visit our website at www.apexbg.com or find us on LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter. Let's get to the point together. Hi, my name is Erin Albert. I am new to Apex Benefits, and my official title is Pharmacy Benefit Practice Lead. But I'm so excited to sneak into the Point podcast and share a little bit more from my world of pharmacy and pharmacy benefits with all of you. I'm also appreciative to Scott and his team for allowing me to kind of hijack the mic, if you will, and debut with a guest who I thought would be an amazing an amazing addition to the Point podcast. If you've not read China RX, it's a great expose on what's actually happening to our particularly generic supply chain of drugs around the world, in that China controls a large amount of active pharmaceutical ingredient manufacturing, and that's the the active portions of our drugs. And I wanted to have Rosemary come on right now due to the fact that we're coming out of the post-COVID-19 lockdowns, and I really wanted her to talk about how our drug supply chain really needs some reinvention now with our national stockpiles, the fact that a lot of drugs have been on shortages, et cetera. So I'm excited to join the Apex Benefits team. I look forward to working with our clients out there in the universe of Indiana and the Midwest in particular. I am a Hoosier native myself, so I'm excited to be a part of this group. So give a listen to my conversation with Rosemary Gibson, author of China RX. Well, we're here today with Rosemary Gibson, and I'm so excited to have her as the first guest where I am serving as host on The Point with Apex Benefits Podcast. So I wanted to come in with a bang, so I I couldn't think of a better guest than Rosemary. And she's the author of a book called China Rx, and I had the opportunity to hear her keynote uh, back in last fall as well. So I wanted to bring her on the podcast today and introduce her to our world and our clients. So Rosemary, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Erin. Yes, and this is so timely now that we're kind of coming out on the other end of the COVID lockdowns. Um, So drug supply is in the supply chain has definitely been an issue. Definitely want to unpack that here with you in the next half hour. So let's first talk about China RX, if if some of our listeners are not familiar. You spent over three years researching the drug manufacturing process globally for this book called China RX. So what sparked your interest just out of curiosity in studying where drugs come from and the book itself? Well, Erin, I was looking to write another book I've written others in the healthcare sphere. I'm an editor at a medical journal, was for about 10 years, called JAMA Internal Medicine. And I stumbled on this subject. I didn't know anything about the the topic, and I just started digging and digging and began to put together the pieces of an incredible story that hardly anyone knew about. And it affects every one of us Uh, in our country as employers, employees, our military, Department of Defense, and our this is a national security issue. And what I uncovered was how dependent we are on China, a single country, for it's not so much the finished pills that we take or the vials of medicine, but over the control over the ingredients and the chemicals because our medicines are basically chemicals formulated to um, help treat disease. And if we're so dependent that if China shut the door within months, our pharmacy shelves would be empty. And so I kept pursuing this story and found people who were adversely affected by it. People who've died from contaminated medicines from China. That's how China RX opens. It opens with a story of a Johns Hopkins trained physician who was healthy and ended up for a routine procedure at a 
healthcare facility and died after getting contaminated blood thinner from China. So we have really serious problems that have come out of China RX, but it's really an honor that now it's out there and members of Congress across the political aisle. This is not a partisan issue. This affects all of us. People in industry uh, and the American public are really um, coming to know this, and it all comes from China RX. And I want your listeners to know that no one paid me to do this. I do it because once you see it, you can't unsee it. And we donate proceeds to good causes, like to help our you know, retired you know, paralyzed veterans and others. So it's an important story, and we have to fix it. Yeah, I'm with you. And I definitely think right now in light of COVID and China shutting down too, this is a very timely topic. So just for my own edification and the listeners out there, Rosemary, your day job is with the Hastings Center. So what is the Hastings Center? Yes, I'm a senior advisor at the Hastings Center, which is in Garrison, New York. It's right across from West Point along the Hudson River, a beautiful setting. And it's a bioethics think tank. And the Hastings Center deals with ethical issues of the day. And certainly this issue of our dependence on China and our access, having accessible medicines, having them not be contaminated, having, so we can trust them. Uh, that's what the Hastings Center does. And it's a real privilege to be uh, with them as a senior advisor. Excellent. Well, let's shift back to drug manufacturing in China. So can you quickly unpack what the history is of drug manufacturing moving to China from the U.S. and or other countries? And why are we so dependent upon China for our drugs right now? In the 1980s, uh, the United States had many uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies and they manufactured everything here. I call it the industrial equivalent of home cooking. They made the chemicals, the ingredients, and the finished drugs right here in the U.S. And they were tightly vertically integrated. But then we got the generic drug law, which has been really helpful to millions of Americans that allowed patented drugs after their patent expired to um, be available in generic versions much cheaper. But then manufacturers were looking for cheaper ways to make them. And meanwhile, China was emerging as a, a real hub of, they've got a lot of chemists, talented people. So in the 90s, and even in the late 80s, we began to see manufacturing of those chemicals move to China. Fast forward to 2000, when the US opened up free trade with China, uh, that and China joined the World Trade Organization, tariffs came down on their products coming here. That's when I documented, Aaron, I'm sitting at the same desk where I was then, and it dawned on me that to show this pattern, but we can't make penicillin anymore in the US. We can't make aspirin. We can't make vitamin C. And that happened within two to three years of opening up free trade with China. And it's not just because China is cheaper with lower labor costs and weaker environmental regulations. It's because China was forming cartels. Its companies were fixing prices, dumping product on the global market, which means selling it way below market prices keeping them low until they drove out their competitors and then raised the prices. That's how we lost our last penicillin plant, our last vitamin C manufacturing capability. These are illegal trade practices, but this is how we've lost it. And it's continuing to this day. And now China is now making about 10% of our generic drugs. And I think they're gonna do the same tactic and uh, drive out world competitors because their aim, stated aim is to become the pharmacy to the world. And they're, if you're an American company and you're, you want to make medicines, you're competing with the Chinese government, not with your companies, because those companies get huge subsidies from the government. So how do you compete? You can't. So you were interviewed on C-SPAN in early March, just before testimony at Congress about the drug supply chain. Did that out of curiosity happen? Because uh, that was right before the coronavirus lockdowns. And has there been any congressional movement after that around you know, drug supply chain and security? Because now clearly that's a national security issue. Uh, yes, Erin, it's very heartening to see that, uh, especially with coronavirus, and this could be a silver lining, 
because we do have to look for silver linings in this situation. There are uh, bills being introduced by members of Congress in the House and Senate on both sides of the aisle, which is good to see. And they are all um, talking about um, this problem and what we need to do to fix it. But we have to make sure that whatever is, um, is eventually legislated, that it has to be a real fix, not just talk about it, but really begin to have the capacity to make you know, critical drugs here in the US. I'll give you an example. Take the medicines that people need who are hospitalized with coronavirus. They, um, they'll need sedatives, they'll need potentially antibiotics, they'll need pressors like dopamine and epinephrine, and 90% of the chemicals to make them are sourced from China. And so we have a situation now where the whole world in a global pandemic is dependent on a single country for these vital ingredients and components. And now 70 countries have imposed export bans on medicines and medical supplies. So we have to be self-sufficient to some degree and have the capacity to make critical drugs. You know, we wouldn't have 80% of the world's oil coming from a single country. And we shouldn't have that for critical drugs. We need to consider them like a strategic asset. You know, these little pills that we take every morning, they're essential for a country to function. Absolutely. And I've always been shocked after, you know, listening to you talk and reading your book about the fact that no one is really responsible for tr tracking where active pharmaceutical ingredients or APIs even come from. What about that movement around FDA or some arm of at least the federal government to start tracking the drug supply chain and where drugs actually come from? Yes, uh, you're right, Erin. One of the big sh shocks, of which there were many in working on China RX, is that it's no one's job in the federal government to know who controls the supply of our medicines. With China RX, that began to change, but it's and that work needs to continue, and industry has some of that data, but even industry doesn't even know some of this. But the reality is that there are data points out there that from people in the industry who have said that China has dominant control over the raw materials and the chemicals to make our medicines. And those are sent out around the world to make the active ingredients, the things that make a medicine medicine. And then those are sent around the world to make finished drugs. We need the capacity to make all of that for our critical medicines. If we look at the medicines for coronavirus, the ones that are out there, hydroxychloroquine and the remdesivir, that's, those chemical components, um, a lot of them come from China. So, um, that's, so we need to know that information about our supply chain. I'm still just shocked that we don't track that. So hopefully out of all of this mess, that might be a silver lining that we get there someday. And we need to do projections, you know, supply and demand and where are we vulnerable? You know, any business does this, any employer, you have to look outward. You know, we predict hurricanes and we prepare for hurricanes. We need to do the same thing with regard to our medicine supply. Agreed. You mentioned that some drug shortages right now are due to shutdowns in China due to the coronavirus. And there are some types of APIs that are actually manufactured in Wuhan itself. What are those? And do you know if they've turned returned to manufacturing yet at this point? Well, you're right, Erin. Uh, Wuhan has been a center of um, making critical components for antibiotics, including azithromycin, which is one of the treatments that uh, patients are getting with coronavirus. Uh, there are shortages of propofol, which is a sedative used for people who are placed on ventilators with COVID. And uh, there's a shortage again because China is the dominant global supplier of the core materials to make it. Uh, so the coronavirus is really exposing our vulnerability. And then we've got the you know, the day-to-day -day blood pressure medicines. This is an important story for employers and their employees. I'm hearing and seeing on social media that some people can't get their blood pressure medicines. They're on back order for, um, for uh, three months. And when you don't take your blood pressure medicine, you're at risk of, you know, strokes and heart attacks. And there might be substitutes, but, you know, doctors don't like to substitute something that isn't optimal for a patient. And how did that happen? That happened because there was a single Chinese company making the key ingredient and it was contaminated with rocket fuel chemicals. And this went around the world 
more than 20 countries and millions of people here. And so the FDA had to shut that down. But in the meantime, um, we're having shortages. And these are shortages of basic, vital medicines. Yeah, absolutely. And that points to China's quality control is just not there. And the company knew it had a problem, but sold it anyway. Scary. <laughs> yeah, so this, that affects your you know, employers and employees about their health and their well-being, because especially in these times with a lot of stress, people want to have their blood pressure under control. So this is very real to people. In fact, I was giving testimony at the U.S.-China Economic and Security Review Commission and a retired Army colonel who was the commissioner, a very distinguished man. He told about how he had three different blood pressure medicines and the ingredient came from China and they had rocket fuel compounds in them. And he said, if I'm getting it, then our active duty military people are getting it. Definitely the rocket fuel should be left for the rockets, not the people. <laughs> not for people. No. So uh, I loved your C-SPAN uh, interview uh, because in it, counter argument to bringing manufacturing, particularly of generic drugs back to the U.S. might be a price-based one. But you argue there are benefits both from a financial perspective as well as an environmental perspective. So how might we bring that manufacturing back to the U.S. and still keep costs in check? Uh, sure. You know, when people talk about costs, they'll talk about, oh, the huge costs of bringing manufacturing back. Look at the costs we are bearing now of scrambling to meet the most basic needs for the most critical drugs to keep people alive. We don't see that, but I talk to people who are on the manufacturing side and they are scrambling. And US-based companies are competing with other countries for a limited supply. We're competing with the world for the same supply. So let's not forget about that cost and the cost of loss of human life potentially. So I just want to put that out there because we just can't think of dollars and cents and what it costs me because these are societal costs as well. Um, we have tremendous um, capability in this country. We have brilliant minds, entrepreneurial folks who, and te new technology that was developed here in the United States to change and improve how we manufacture our generic drugs. It's called advanced manufacturing technology that it's a technology that's been used in the chemical industry for a hundred years, but the pharmaceutical industry has never really adopted it in a large scale. And we can make our critical generic drugs faster, cheaper, with a smaller environmental footprint and real-time quality control and make them right here in the United States. That's the future. And this would bring jobs back to communities. It would, you know, we need economic stimulus now, and these are good paying, STEM jobs. So there's tremendous opportunity. In terms of cost, I was listening to a tremendous documentary on Dutch public television, and an industry person said, well, if we brought this manufacturing back to Europe, it would cost us just 10 to 15% more. And with advanced manufacturing, because it can be done with a smaller footprint, those who have led this field, and these are people who've worked in the industry for many years, they said they were selling critical generic drugs to African countries. And they said, we can make it for 38% less than the usual means of making it. So I think we have to open up our manufacturing to the entrepreneurs, the people who want to do things differently and can solve a really important health issue and national security issue for our country and to meet the needs of employers and employees and all of us of seniors around the country. It's interesting, you mention hurricanes and how we kind of prepare for those. So Rosemary, what do you recommend that the federal government do so that we don't get stuck in a next pandemic without adequate drug supply in our stockpiles? Do you think we need a country of origin, for example, for APIs as a requirement for drug labels? Do you think we just need to bring advanced manufacturing back and get these drugs manufactured where we can control them? Or do you think it's kind of all of the above there? Uh, it's a combination, Erin. It's uh, first of all, identifying what are the most critical medicines and what's our capability to make them and where are we dependent? And what are must-haves? We don't have to make all of them here, but what are absolute must-haves? 
And that might be a list of uh, several hundred medicines and which ones are top priority. And where are the supply chains right now so fragile? I, we have some medicines that are single sourced in China. And when one company blew up in China, there was a global shortage. So I would prioritize. And that list has already been created. That memo has been written. And then we need, uh, and how do you start bringing it back? Well, if, if you and I want to open up a manufacturing plant here in the U.S., we need contracts. We need people who are going to pay us to do this. And one way to start that is um, and there's a Buy American executive order that's been drafted, and there's legislation also in the House and Senate that would move toward this. And it's bipartisan, which is great. And that is to have the Department of Defense and the VA and the Strategic National Stockpile to buy um, from U.S.-based manufacturers to stimulate, you know, to give you and me as manufacturers a break so we can start building here and employing people here. And the other thing we can do is we can stockpile the active ingredient, which lasts longer than stockpiling the finished drugs. And then when we need them, we can have, you know, facilities on standby to turn them into finished products, which is a lot easier than starting from scratch. So we don't have shortages for the next coronavirus or pandemic, which will happen in our lifetime, it will happen. So we predict hurricanes, we can predict this will happen, we can be uh, prepared as best we can. What other solutions, Rosemary, do you think we have to secure drugs in the US? So for example, I know you uh, mentioned Civica RX in other uh, venues. What is Civica RX? Uh, Civic RX is a brilliant uh, innovation. It's a nonprofit organization and it's comprised of about 1,300 hospitals started by the Mayo Clinic and others because they were, have been really concerned about drug shortages. And we have shortages of nothing in the United States of America except critical drugs. And we can talk some other time on how that is and why that is, which is completely unacceptable. We're talking about last resort antibiotics. And doctors have had to ration chemotherapy drugs from time to time. And these, again, these are all the generics. And so they uh, said, we're going to do something different. We're going to, uh, initially, they want to get into their own manufacturing, but initially they're contracting with trustworthy companies in trustworthy countries. They have a no China policy to make active ingredients. And we're going to pay them a fair price, not the race to the bottom price. And we're going to give them long-term contracts. Because what happens now, if you have a contract for a year and it changes you know, the following year, then you're not going to invest in your manufacturing facility. You can't win that game. And there's full transparency on cost and full transparency on country of origin. And within a year of startup, they produced, they were delivering 19 critical drugs, including last resort antibiotics. And now there's another a 20 slated for um, this year. So it's really remarkable what they're doing. And it shows that when we allow the market to work and we have fair prices, not gouging people, not running to the bottom of the barrel, we can solve shortages. I mean, this is what you do in a marketplace. But the current system we have you know, more broadly hasn't allowed that, but Civica is showing we can fix this. And now with coronavirus, they're able to supply their hospitals and not have their hospitals be in shortages, which is exactly what we should be doing. Amen. Do you know by chance if FDA inspectors have returned to China yet to inspect drug manufacturing facilities? Uh, they have not. They, uh, earlier this year, the FDA withdrew all of its inspectors from uh, other countries. And I don't know what they're doing here in the U.S., but they've withdrawn them from China and other places. So the, the medicines that are coming in from there, no one's inspecting those manufacturing plants. And no one tests. The other thing is no one tests every single batch of product coming here which is, and you know, there's an independent group up in Connecticut. They started testing generic drugs and more than 10% of them didn't pass muster. I know ASHP has been very gracious during the coronavirus lockdowns to provide their drug shortages list and FDA also has a drug shortages list. Do you have any other suggestions on places where folks can look to see what's going on with the drug supply chain and if, if they, for some reason, need a specific drug or? 
Well, I think those lists are great. And it's really interesting to see on those, the FDA list for sure, you'll see companies that are, have stopped making products. What we're seeing is the Western generic drug companies like Mylan, Teva, and Sandoz are, they said they're dropping half their products. This was before the coronavirus. And that's because they can't compete with China. So what we're seeing is even more centralization. And the FDA shortage list says it, um, a product not available, manufacturers cease production or something like that. But those are, are good sources. And also if people wanna find out, uh, try to find out where their medicines are made, read China RX, we have an appendix there that describes how people can uh, find out where their medicines are made. Uh, there's a website called Daily Med, but China RX has other resources to find out. And you know, uh, start asking the question when you go to your pharmacy, say, so where's this made? Ask if you can see the box, take a picture with your phone. And um, saying we need to have medicines made in trustworthy countries. And we need to bring some of that manufacturing back home. Definitely. So Rosemary Gibson, thank you so much for being part of this point podcast with me for the first time ever. Um, what is the call to action here? So our clients are mainly employers who are trying to get the best health care and pharmacy benefits that they can for their employees. So what is what do you think we can all help happen in this country to bring advanced manufacturing back and get these drugs back in our own stockpiles? What other calls to action can we do to serve uh, this huge public health need? Well, I, I hope your listeners will um, read China RX. I wrote it in the public interest for all of us. It's very readable. I wrote it so my mother could read it. And it starts out with a story that's threaded throughout. Uh, people can follow me on Twitter at Rosemary100. And if uh, you believe that we should be making some medicines here in this country, uh, so there's a contact your member of Congress and say, we need to buy American and develop some self-reliance for now and for the future. And for individuals, start asking the question, so where is this medicine coming from? And also, if you feel as if you're not doing well on a particular medicine, mention it to your doctor. Don't hesitate. Tell your pharmacist, tell your physician, tell your healthcare provider that something just doesn't seem right. Because even switching between generics, one versus another, some, they do have some uh, slight differences. Don't hesitate to speak up if you've been switched and something just doesn't seem right. That's why it's so critical if, if for example, it's a hypertension medication that you're taking your own blood pressure. Because if you do switch between generics, sometimes the excipients, to your point, Rosemary, can be different. And you may not respond to that. Or there's something in the drug, like rocket fuel, that's definitely not there for any efficacy reasons. That's right. And I hope people will share their experience. Uh, contact me on Twitter at Rosemary100 to give voice to this. So we're just not dealing with this alone as individuals, uh, but we can surface these, uh, these issues and, and raise them and then begin to fix them. Well, with that, Rosemary Gibson, author of China Rx, thank you for being part of the podcast today. We so appreciate your insights, and I, it's definitely a great time to have this conversation now that the coronavirus is coming out and we are depleted on a lot of our vital healthcare and drug needs in this country. Well, together we can fix it, Erin. Thank you so much for having me, and I appreciate your listeners' interest in China Rx. You can find more episodes for free on iTunes by searching The Point or Apex Benefits. Please rate, review, and subscribe to be the first to know about what we have in store for you. To learn more about Apex Benefits, please visit our website at www.apexbg.com or find us on LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter. Let's get to the point together.